Um, thank you for joining um, us for today's panel discussion and Q&A on mathematical modeling in the age of COVID-19. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded, um, so you will be able to share a link um, after the event is complete, and we welcome you to revisit this content yourself and share it with your colleagues. We also invite your comments and questions. So please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. And if you think of a question at any point for our speakers, just type it in there. And I will either pose it to our speaker at that time or hold it for the discussion portion of the event. Today's moderator is Steve Elliott. Steve Elliott is our Senior Publishing Editor of Mathematics at De Gruyter. Um, at this time, I am going to hand the floor over to Steve, who will introduce our speakers. Steve, it's all yours. Okay, thanks, Caitlin. On behalf of De Gruyter, welcome. Uh, just a quick overview about De Gruyter. We're an international independent publisher. We've been publishing for over 270 years, just to talk about our rich legacy and his history of mathematics. Our legacy in mathematics extends back to 1826, almost 200 years ago, when August Leopold Krelle founded the Journal of Period and Applied Mathematics, now simply known as Krelle's Journal. In addition, our portfolio consists of over 39 other, of 39 other journals, both open access and subscription. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our distinguished book publishing program, which now consists of well over a thousand mathematics titles in print that span all areas of mathematics, including, but not limited to algebra, group theory, applied math mathematics, and stochastics. We're quite proud of the fact that our publications are not only of interest to mathematicians, but also address areas of physics and, engin and engineering through their focus on applied mathematics. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our distinguished list of panelists and I thank them profusely for taking time out of their busy schedule to join us. Uh, we'll start with Lucy Zhang. Lucy is a professor in the Department of Mechanical, Aerospace, and Nuclear Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in beautiful Troy, New York. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. She received her PhD from Northwestern University. Her research and interests are in building advanced and robust computational tools and software for accurate and efficient multi-physics and multi-scale simulations that can be used in engineering applications in biomechanics, micro and nanomechanics, medicine and defense projects. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Lucy is now the host of the, and I, you should all take a listen to this, to the uh, podcast, This Academic Life. I'm a, I'm a, a frequent listener and it's a really great podcast. And anyway, yeah, so thank you, Lucy. Okay, Guo Wei Wei is uh, at Michigan State University where he's a foundation professor of mathematics, electrical and computer engineering. He earned his PhD degree from the University of British Columbia. His current research interests include mathematical bioscience, deep learning, drug discovery, computational geometry, topology, and graph theory. He served extensively in a wide variety of national and international panels and many journal editorships. Next joining us, uh, I'd like to welcome Tamar Schlick. Tamar is a professor of chemistry, mathematics, and computer science at New York University. She earned her PhD in applied mathematics from the Courant Institute of Science. Her research is in developing innovative mathematical and computational tools for biomolecular engineering, I'm sorry, biomolecular modeling and simulation, applying them to important biological problems. She's a member of several editorial boards, advisor committees, and advisor committees in mathematics, computational biology, and chemistry. She's the author of the seminal book, Molecular Modeling and Simulation, which you may have heard of. It's used in many biophysics courses worldwide. Finally, but of course not least, Jean Cujones Cortez is a PhD student in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. His research is funded through a Fulbright, Fulbright Fellowship Program. John began working, in, working on his PhD in 2019 after after uh, working as an innovation project engineer and quality assurance engineer in industry. 
as well as an adjunct professor of engineering. John, I guess that adjunct professor of engineering commits you to get your PhD, so that's great. Uh, his current research focuses on machine learning, uh, computational fluid dynamics, data analytics and turbulence, renewable energy, and biomedical engineering. Okay, just wanted to give a brief overview of what we're gonna discuss here. We've, we've broken this up into three parts. Part one is gonna be discussion of the impact of COVID-19 on our panelists' research. Part two, we're gonna discuss mathematical modeling techniques that our panelists have used to analyze COVID-19. And then in part three, we will touch on cross-departmental institutional collaboration as it relates to COVID-19. Okay, let's get started. So here we go. Okay, so <clears throat> we're all zoomed out and Zoom zombie now. Zoom zombies now. I know I spend, I don't know, sometimes it seems like all day sitting in front of a screen talking to my colleagues. But seriously, I want to discuss the impacts of virtual, virtu of this virtual new way of collaboration. Just, I, if you, we can just start and talk about how it's impacted your research and how you've conducted experiments. Do you do them in the lab? Do you do them virtually? Just tell me about the good, the bad, and the ugly, because presumably there's things that we've learned and maybe our efficiency has improved. Maybe we're interacting more with colleagues. So tomorrow, why don't we start with you? Can you oh, give us your overview on this? Sure. So good morning, uh, good afternoon. Um, I think that fortunately applied mathematicians, computational biologists are very adept to working at home. And I think as long as you're focused and motivated and have a reasonable home office environment, you can get a lot of work at home. Uh, and um, I think in the case of my group, we shifted very quickly to working on Zoom. It was very natural. Um, and in fact, it allowed us to include some of our group members who were overseas and we had weekly group Zoom meetings. And I think that kept everybody pretty motivated and, and focused. And I liked actually the ability of being able to communicate with a broad group of scientists, including collaborators outside of NYU. Great, thanks. John, any comments on that? Anything to add or? Yeah, regarding the, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemics uh, arrived to us in the lab, um, we also quickly adapted to the, uh, to the um, situation. Uh, in our group, we usually used to do uh, research based on turbulent boundary layers applied to uh, uh, energy, renewable energy and wind energy. So when it appears, we saw a very uh, nice opportunity to apply our knowledge in turbulent boundary layer with uh, CFD modeling. So that was part of our switch. And Great. we saw very good opportunities to apply in disinfection technologies. Okay, Lucy, you have, thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Lucy, you have anything you want to add there? Yeah, I want to add that uh, even though it was relatively easy for people like us doing simulations and modeling to work at home, uh, the challenges are often related to family, at, at small kids, and having them around was uh, somewhat of a you know second job at the time because I had to home uh, schooling. So that was uh, one major challenge. And then a second major challenge associated with um, sort of research productivity is I observed that junior faculty um, are probably the most affected groups of uh, people because um, for them, interactions and, and in-person interactions and simply getting to know people uh, in that sense uh, casually is no longer available option for them. So they have to intentionally make appointment to talk to people or to know people. Wow. So I felt like those were the two major things that would affect our, the people who do what we do. Well, Wei, you, would you like to add anything? Or? Yeah, I think uh, what has been said is very good. I mean, actually, we are similar to our situation. We basically jumped immediately into core lighting related research because previously we are working on the protein protein interaction, protein like interaction, things like that. And there's a lot of things of those aspects in terms of a drug 
uh, in terms of drug discovery and also the mechanism of, of the co lighting. So we, we quickly adapted the, the situation and actually there's uh, quite a, a number of experimental stuff. They are lab they, because they cannot go to lab do any do their lab research any further and then they ask to collaborate with us. So actually we pick up a, quite a few more collaboration during the course. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Okay, so now as we, we're gonna pivot to part two now of our, of our discussion, but, I, I, <clears throat> but before we do that as a, as a general segue, I'd like to just go around the, around the quote unquote room with our panelists and just talk generally about what your research was as it relates to mathematics uh, pre-COVID-19 and how you generally pivoted your, your research to COVID-19 uh, things. Um, well, Wei, you just mentioned that. Um, so, so John, why don't, you, why don't we start with you? So can you talk a little bit about what you were doing previously, your research, and then how, and how it changed or how you pivoted or modified it to COVID-19 in general? In our next portion, we'll get to the specific mathematical techniques. But just in general, can you, can you address that for me? Yeah, previously, uh, we worked with uh, machine learning algorithms to forecast um, uh, renewable energy sources. Uh -huh. And also, we work with uh, CFD modeling for applications in renewable energy. Uh, uh, when the COVID-19 arrives, we pivoted to uh, the uh, modeling of respiratory flows like coughing, sneezing, um, breath to understand the transport of the droplets and the finite fate of these. So that way we can uh, implement um, disinfection technologies for uh, indoor environments like uh, schools, uh, oh, great. Uh, retails, et cetera. Oh, great. <laughs> Lucy, what about you? Um, we didn't really do much pivoting uh, okay. necessarily because we had always done simulation modeling and uh, improving methods in order to fit different types of applications. So mm -hmm. COVID-19 was really uh, another application. So we worked a lot with actually John's uh, research group on um, uh, different uh, aspect of, you know, filtering design and, and uh, situation arrangements and all that. So it was uh, different applications. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, great. Tamar? Any, I... Yeah, so for us, um, it's like a nice story, a case of basic science turns applied science. We have been working for a long time on RNA structure analysis and design. And in, in particular, we're fortunate the last two, three years to focus on what's called um, dual graphs for RNA that contain pseudo knots. These are very intertwined RNA shapes or motifs. And so when COVID hit, um, I wanted to contribute to all these efforts and understanding um, viral mechanisms. And we had all the machinery available for us to shift on working on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the infectious agent of COVID-19. And we focused on a small region of the RNA that I could talk about later. But right. um, we shifted to that, and that has been our focus for the past two and a half years. Wow. Okay. Go away. Anything to add there? Yeah. So basically, my my <coughs> my lab is work on the protein protein interaction, protein like interaction, and also drug discovery, and uh, use the methodology like uh, deep learning and also mathematics, a particular type of mathematics we do as uh, using the algebraic topology. And, and those things that uh, is, a, is a part of a topology, it's like a precision homology, things like that. They are able to do a high level abstraction of uh, complicated structures. And that's, all, that's how it's relevant to protein because the protein is really complicated. So if you reduce the dimensionality over there, you're going to achieve better effects in the deeper learning. So that's the idea, and I use such a technique uh, for protein-protein interaction. So basically, you got one protein in the virus, so the so-called spike protein, mm -hmm. and then there's other protein is a human receptor. That's how the virus get into our body. 
So the, through, the, through the protein protein interaction. So that's how particular type of mathematics has been used over there. So we basically immediately jump into the situation after the lockdown in the Wuhan, that's uh, January of 2020. And then my team has been working on this subject from that on. Wow, okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, um, uh, yeah. So John, do you, do, you, do you wanna mention some, do you wanna talk around or briefly address some uh, specific um, mathematical techniques you've been, you've been using? Uh, and yeah, it's, it's to discuss the specific techniques for it. And if you want to, I know you've done research in robotics as well. So if you want to mention that, that would be great. Yeah, uh, actually, um, when the COVID-19 uh, come up, we saw a very, very good opportunity to um, implement technologies, disinfection technologies in the schools, uh, hospitals, and uh, businesses to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. So one thing that we did was to think in the uh, use of robots to disinfect the, uh, these spaces because uh, with robots, the contact of people is, uh, is less, right? Mm -hmm. right? Even though we have this opportunity, we saw that uh, with fluid mechanics, since this is a fluid mechanics problem, we could um, uh, analyze and understand what is the uh, final fate and the transport of these robots inside the room. And with this, uh, help to this robot to uh, optimize the disinfection path. Mm -hmm. So with this in mind, uh, in the group, we just start to think, okay, which, uh, what techniques we can use, uh, especially during this uh, um, um, lockdown that we have at that time. So experiments were limited and um, the analytical techniques that uh, we have at, the, at that time didn't allow us to uh, analyze complex uh, environments like classrooms with several people or several um, components in, inside the room. So that we did was to use uh, typical uh, navier stokes equations oh, okay. uh, for what? To model these uh, respiratory flows like uh, coughing, sneezing, or mm -hmm. breathing. As we know that uh, these uh, respiratory flows are turbulent uh, in nature. So we use the Navier stocks and we use techniques like uh, Reynolds average Navier stocks uh, to try to predict the fate of these particles and the transfer of these particles. And we use this information from the uh, uh, modeling with the Re Re Reynolds average Navier stocks equations to fit uh, the information in the robot. This way, mm -hmm. the robot uh, optimize the path of disinfection. And actually we demonstrate uh, that this robot can um, improve the um, filtration and disinfection uh, against the um, commercial types of air cleaning technologies that are static. So uh -huh. we demonstrate that with uh, uh, the modeling we use and the interaction between CFD and robotics. So you actually, so I, I'm, this intrigues me. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as, a, as the whole discussion does, but anyway, but just really quick question. So you went from modeling the robots to, I just wonder where we are today. I hope the panelists will indulge me for a second. Where are we, where are we today? Did, does, does, so we modeled the robots, but did the robots actually exist now? Are you manufacturing them? Are they out there in use or how does that work? Uh, actually, we, um, we designed the robot. This robot has uh, several units that include wow. the uh, filtration unit and also includes wow. the disinfection unit. Uh -huh. uh, but um, yes, at, the, at that time, we designed the robot from, from the scratch, right? Uh, it was, right. Uh, yeah, it was uh, actually, it was a multidisciplinary team. Uh, as Professor Lucy mentioned before, we work with uh, Resenlar, with RPI, we were also with some universities in China and oh, other wow. departments inside, inside Purdue that are more, they have more expertise in the uh, robot design wow. part. So that we did was use this uh, knowledge in fluid mechanics, in turbulent flows and in boundary layers to fit the, uh, 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 the robot um, design. Wow, great. And I'm sure there's a, there's a patent somewhere out there, hopefully. Oh, yeah, we are working okay. on Okay, all right, tomorrow. It's a publication. <laughs> I okay. love it. We're all applied mathematicians and doing all these other fields, right, and applications. Yeah. 
the power yeah. of mathematics. Um, so, well, uh, before I talk about the fields, I'll just sure. mention what we work on. So, um, we focused on the frame shifting element. It's a small RNA piece of the SARS CoV 2 virus. And it's very important because it's responsible for initiating viral protein production and infection. And therefore, there's been a lot of um, effort on understanding how it works. The frame shifting element is associated with ribosomal pausing and backtracking. And that's necessary to make the right viral proteins and so on. Um, and now it's believed that the right RNA shape or motif um, is critical to this ribosomal pausing and frame shifting. And um, what is not known is what shapes this frame shifting RNA adopts and how it transitions among these different conformations. So um, in applying our tools to understand the structures and mechanisms of the frame shifting element, we apply tools from graph theory, from wow. topology, um, a lot of um, applied mathematics tools like genetic algorithms, uh, clustering, um, of course, molecular dynamics, simulations, and also multiple sequence alignment to understand um, the evolution of this frame shifting element through families of coronaviruses. Wow. So all that information from modeling and simulation, historical perspective, biophysical mechanism help us better understand the complex conformational landscape of this, um, our small RNA. Right. Okay, thanks. Well, Wei, you're shaking your head, so I guess you know about this stuff. <laughs> how, yeah. does, uh, how does your research relate to this? Is it similar? Or yeah, you maybe maybe different before, I, before I do that, I just try sure. to understand a bit more what the two men said. So it was fascinating what she said. So, so those multiple, for those type of frame shift is a small part of the RNA, is a, in the early part of the sequence, is that true? The early part of what? Over the whole genome sequence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's a part, a, a very small part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's essential for making the polyproteins that start um, the viral protein production that enables the virus to infect host cells and then replicate. So the, in the what is the NSP1 or something like that, or even earlier than that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all part of uh, the, this viral protein production process. And this is a key step that's very essential to understand. And therefore the frame shifting element has been a drug target because if we can um, affect, and I should mention here that um, you've heard a lot of um, viral proteins like the spike protein and a lot mm -hmm. of drugs are targeting the viral proteins. Mm -hmm. But, um, and those as we know are evolving very quickly and therefore our vaccines and our drugs have to evolve as well. Um, going to the viral, to the actual RNA genomes has a lot of potential because those are much more highly conserved and therefore having um, uh, drugs or uh, genetic uh, therapy or mutations that will affect these processes can have can be more um, more useful and uh, more robust in that sense. Okay, go, go away. Do you want to add anything or? Yeah, this is a, actually an excellent idea to target those conservative regime. For example, like a Pfizer drug is now is approved for emergency use. That's a target of the, 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 actually the main protest and the, the catalyzed center for main protest actually very conservative. So that's why drug, Pfizer drug is not a much impacted by most mutations. So my, my group more, mostly my group focus on the mutation aspects of the whole genome of the SARS-CoV-2. So basically we try to understand how mutation impact the, impact the infectivity. That's one thing. So you know, there's alpha and the beta, gamma, delta, and so on and so forth. There's Omicron and Omicron BA2 at this point. Mm -hmm. So those things are one after the other one, most of them getting actually more and more infectious. Those are the deal to the mutation on the spike protein we mentioned a moment ago. And those spike protein is a part, there's a spike protein from virus and there's a human cell receptor here 
they bind to each other, and this binding, uh, the, the strength is determined the infectivity. If the strength is very strong after mutation, and then the infectivity becomes stronger. So that's, the, that's the something we're looking into that. That's only one aspect, the infectivity. Other thing we look at it is the, how this mutation and this spike protein, the binding domain, is going to impact the drug and also vaccine. And that's a big story now because we know Omicron actually is able to break through a lot of different inf infection and, and antibody and vaccine. So that's because of the mutation over there, mm. they're actually able to make originally protection become unprotected. So we are trying to understand overall, we try to understand what is the mechanism for this virus evolution from original virus started found in Wuhan to the current one, like BA2, also impact China, a lot of region, and Hong Kong. And it's now it's a dominant uh, variant in the whole world. So we try to understand the mechanism for that. So that's wow. what we do. Wow, you're scaring the hell out of me. But anyway. Well, oh. you certainly <laughs> have evolving data, right, as uh, coming very quickly. Yeah, sounds like it. OK, uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Lucy, maybe you won't scare me so much. What about your 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 mathematical techniques? What do you mean? Yeah, you mean? so <laughs> that scared me too. <laughs> I think <laughs> that this, the major distinction uh, between Tamar and Guowei's uh, research, comparing to John and my research, yeah. mm -hmm. is that we actually do physical models. Uh, mm -hmm. not just mathematical models. So, so yeah. the physical model, there's a physical representation. We do discretization, like what John had previously mentioned, you know, Navier Stokes equation to look at particle flows and you know, physical room and constraints with boundary conditions. So yeah, so so you know, I do very much uh, what John had been talking about with the physical modeling. Um, so some of the things that uh, you know, my background is on um, simulations and modeling, so fluid structure interactions, it's like multi physics coupled uh, systems. So um, so the robot that John had earlier talked about that was a really interesting uh, uh, research because it involves so many different things. It involves mm -hmm. moving moving object like the robot and then how it's constantly interacting with the surrounding particles which may involve uh, viral particles. So one challenge that we're uh, trying to tackle right now is to how to provide that with real feed, uh, real uh, time feedback, right? So the robot needs to react in real time which would give it a more meaningful path planning. So that's part of the things that we're trying to do. How do we uh, revamp some of the traditional way of doing computational fluid dynamics um, into something that's you know, more efficient, even more efficient, utilizing uh, you know, any computing capability that we may have and the way we construct uh, you know, tree models in term, not, not real tree models, but, but tree models in terms of data, constructing data structures, right? So to uh, distribute your information more effectively. Um, so, you know, those are the things that we're looking at. And, you know, some other physical models that we're looking at is to look at um, materials like masks, right? Like masks that we wear, its property would change over time due to temperature and local humidity. As we're breathing into it, humidity changes locally and temperature changes. And how is that affecting the effectiveness of the mask? And that needs to be um, sort of undertaken because uh -huh. there's, there's so many little, you know, small particles that changes face uh, as you're breathing. And so, uh, so those are the physical models that we're trying to build, utilizing the prior knowledge or methodologies that we have developed if, before for multi-physics coupled mm -hmm. systems. Okay, great. Okay, so now um, I just want to touch, I think everybody touched on this briefly, but is there, I, because there's a lot of interest in uh, machine learning and AI, um, I think everyone mentioned this, but does anybody want to add anything on how you're particularly using machine learning and AI? I know Guo, Guo Wei, you mentioned uh, deep learning. Does anybody else have anything to add on machine learning, AI, data mining? I think that certainly in biology research, we're all using machine learning, AI in some 
sense mm -hmm. because the amount of data um, is enormous and uh, and you can account for it in different ways. And in our case, for example, we, we look at the structure, all the, the RNA universe, the motif atlas. Mm -hmm. And we use that for RNA design and um, understanding submotifs of RNA and so on. Um, and that's actually used in our work to design mutations of the frame shifting element that would hamper this crucial role of frame shifting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly I could see the increasing role of machine learning and AI in all aspects mm -hmm. of applied, uh, applied math and right. all aspect of applied mm -hmm. science. Right. Okay, does anybody else want to add anything? I'll move on to the next. Uh... Okay, great. Okay, so now another uh, critical and interesting question. I'll just ask you all to just chime in uh, when, you, when you want, because uh, this is uh, very interesting to me. I'm just, of course, where is your, I'm just wondering, has your, for, for this new advent of COVID-19 research and things, where is your funding come, come from? Has your, have, your, uh, <clears throat> have your funding methods changed um, on the research? Have you, have you for instance, uh, applied for, uh, grants from the NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, Department of Defense, National Science Foundation, others. Any any interesting grants from the Gates Foundation or or anything like that that you didn't previously get? i um, just just throw it out there. Um, whoever uh, go away. You want to go first? No, we'll just. Yeah, I mean, before the pandemic, so we were founded by NIH, NSF, and uh, NASA, and. Uh, other places and uh, like a uh, drug dis discovery company like uh, Pfizer, that's the place uh, they have a uh, wow. vaccine and things like that, breast mask. Uh, and uh, then during the pandemic, we focus on the NIH uh, correlating related research and uh, then our new proposal uh, wow. is going to get funded or something like that, yeah. So it does impact our work and also impact our funding pattern and the resource, uh, source, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll oh, go ahead, Tamar, please. Yeah, so in, in our case, um, as I mentioned, we were doing basic research on RNA structure. It was mostly funded by NIGMS at NIH, National Institute of General Medical Sciences. But um, when the pandemic hit and we decided to shift to this frame shifting element, um, there was uh, NSF announced these rapid grants, rapid awards. And um, I, I applied in, uh, in a few days, and within four or five days, I heard a notice. I received a notice of award. I think wow. it was the fastest ever, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, proposal to award time, um, and easiest in the sense that um, that it was such a great opportunity to focus, and it was a one one year award. Um, but uh, a good amount of money that enabled us to focus on um, this pivoted research. Oh, great. Thanks. John, do you want to add anything? Oh, yes. Uh, when the, when in 2020, when the COVID-19 appears, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, get a funding from Intel Corporation uh, wow. within the... Uh, a program they call Pandemic uh, Response Technology Initiative. So we use uh, this uh, funding to um, um, develop and design this, uh, this robot we work in at that time. So that's pretty much uh, we got um, funding. Okay, oh great, okay, great. Okay, so now um, we did have one question that, come, that came up and I'm gonna ask the panelists to mention it now before we get too far afield. Um, one of our uh, registrants is asking uh, regarding, maybe each of you can address this to an extent, regarding data mining, um, can you mention some specifics, uh, some specific data mining techniques, e.g. Uh, association rules, clustering, decision trees? All of the above. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, go ahead. Please. Yeah, all of the above, plus uh, in our case, random forests um, and um, other techniques. Okay, anybody else want to, Guo, Wei, you want to add anything? Or? 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, they are machine learning. There are many different tasks over there. So you got a you got things like uh, classification, regression, and also clustering, and then dimension reduction. That's a four major tasks. So those four, all of those four major tasks are relevant to correlating. So in terms of data mining, you can use things like uh, k-means, and also you can use things like uh, deep learning. So, and also you can do things like a dimension reduction, use, uh, use PCA and uh, TSNE, and also UMAP, things like that. And the most importantly for drug discovery, you can do things like a generative technique, things like that, like uh, transformers, uh, autoencoders, uh, past things like uh, recently, like uh, alpha fold, you can use those techniques to find out the structure for the, for the new proteins, things like that. There's a full spectrum of AI technique can be used for SARS correlating, uh, SARS CoV 2 related research. Okay. Uh, Lucy, you want to add anything there? Or, or no? Yeah, ours is quite different uh, in, in terms of, uh, in that sense. We are really just learning from the simul simulated data. Uh, you know, okay. it's, a lot of it is. A, uh, synthetic and a lot of it is the combined. So it's a uh, it really depends on what what uh, kind of data we have at hand. Uh, so. John, I, I assume that your answer would be the same as Lucy, Lucy's. Your research kind of overlaps, but maybe you want to add. Something. Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, uh, in part, uh, the robot use uh, uh, algorithm also uh, oh. with machine learning with the information we uh, uh, they use in the in the uh, a machine learning algorithm, some of the uh, inputs were, that came from the from the simulations. So they use um, essentially uh, recurrent neural networks to try to uh, in, um, improve the optimization path. But um, more than that, uh, we didn't involve too much in the, in the, okay. the uh, machine learning part. We was more focused on the uh, modeling part. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna just pivot a little bit. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, where your work's been published. But before we do that, I, we, <clears throat> I'm gonna put in a, a quick word about the Greuter's uh, Open Access Journal, Computational Mathematical Biophysics, which has recently published some interesting, uh, interesting special issues as it relates to COVID-19. COVID so with that, I wanna hand it, I wanna hand it over to, uh, our, uh, who's joining us, uh, Sean Zhao from University of uh, Alabama, who's one of the uh, editors of the journal. And uh, Sean, do you want to talk about, can you talk about a little bit? Just walk yeah. us the journal. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, so the computational and the mathematical biophysics, uh, this journal was established in the 2013. And so this year uh, we're going to publish its 10th anniversary volume. And this journal is indexed in the uh, uh, Scopus and the MathCI net, and it aims to publish high quality work at the interface of mathematics and the biology. So when the COVID uh, hit us in the 2020, we quickly responded and uh, organized a special issue for people to report, you know, how mathematical methods and models can help to combat this pandemic. And in last year, we also published three successful special issues. And given this, uh, this success, we currently have three special issues opening except for, for publication in uh, 2022. And as you can see that the topics of the three, three special issues uh, covers many different uh, uh, topics such as uh, decision-making, uh, healthy policy, and the sequence and structure-based analysis, various evolution, and AI for the uh, drug design. So um, if the audience, if you're interested, uh, just take a picture of the screen and then you can Google your name to Google our channel and on a channel web page, you can find out more options. I mean, more information about the special issues. If you have questions, yeah, yeah, feel free to contact with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Wow, great. So some of our participants can get their uh, get their research published right away. And I'm glad we're able to uh, able to help in that. Great. Okay, so now uh, just quickly uh, pivoting back um, just from, from, from the uh, panelists, I guess, um, Tamar, why don't, 
well, just in general, but tomorrow, why don't we start with you? Um, has your, has, has where you've been published shifted recently because of COVID-19? Um, is it going more towards life science journals, mathematics journals? Where, where are you publishing recently? Nature, yeah. science, you know? I, I think all of them, we, we were always, we already were publishing in various journals from um, mathematics, biophysics, chemistry, um, computer science, and even bioengineering. Um, and so I think it was um, not a big change, but, um, but also the, our COVID related research was published uh, in three papers, um, one in a physical journal, one is, so that's biophysics. The second was more in the chemistry in Jack's Journal of American Chemical Society. These are all both society journals of the Biophysical Society, the American Chemical Society. And now we um, have a paper in, um, submitted to a nature journal. So um, to reach a broader uh, readership. So um, I think that's natural evolution in this kind of multidisciplinary work. Um, and there certainly are numerous venues. Um, I also, in the context of biophysics, biophysical journal organized two special issues, how biophysicists address COVID-19. And we published two in uh, 2021. Um, oh, wow variety of work that includes all of the type of work you've described here and, and more applied. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lucy, any any new uh, different journals you're publishing in or just the yeah, same? We, yeah, so John and, uh, you know, and the robotics team that we had been working with, um, that's sort of the field that we were not in before and we were able to uh, publish one on that. Uh, in totally different uh, perspective. So, and all the other ones that um, on my own side, they're more uh, towards software development. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working with uh, some um, startups, uh, companies who are doing uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, scenario and situation model software development. So I'm working some uh, with them on some development on that side, not necessarily publication because mm -hmm. they're, proprietary oh. um but yeah but just uh you know kind of uh you know different fields that we were able to get into other that we would not be able to before mm -hmm. john anything fr from your perspective and or just don't yeah fr thing? yes uh, um from our group we had uh, several publications uh, related with covid19 um one of those three two of those uh, were related to Robotics, one in robotics and autonomous systems. We published there the uh, the results of the integration of CFD with uh, with robotics for oh, the wow. development of these uh, disinfection uh, robots. And also we have um, uh, two additional papers. One uh, that is more related uh, to the basics of the modeling we use to to fit the robot. This is in a journal of uh, building. Uh, engineering building environment. So we are working on that. Um, wow. mm -hmm. And the other one is in the scientific reports in nature. It's wow. more related uh, of a technology that we develop for a new mask uh, that other colleagues uh, are working also in the group. Wow, wow, that's interesting. Can you, can you I'm just, again, I'm interested. <laughs> can you yeah. tell me more about this mask? Like what material, is it a new material or does, yeah, does, it's does a new material mask. science coming into this as well? I mean, it's really yes. an intersection. Yes, it's a, it's a new material. They have a, a, a new um, kind of um, uh, mask. Uh, mm -hmm. I cannot talk too much about the material, but oh. <laughs> this, uh, okay. yes, but this, but this publication is now uh, in a scientific reports nature in uh -huh. the COVID-19 edition. So this was oh, wow. part also, uh, it was part of um, uh, experiments we, we did to, to develop this new mask. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great. Hey, Lucy. Well, well uh, I'll get go well, away. I'll get to you in a minute. I, I know Lucy. I know we talked briefly previously before the webinar about fi finite element modeling, and is is that being used with the masks or, or maybe? Yeah, I'll... yeah. So that's actually a, a different one from what John was talking about. Okay. The one 
Yeah, that we're working on our uh, finite element based simulation and modeling and uh, in order to find uh, mechanical properties of masks due to okay. changing in temperature and, and, and humidity. And, and, so, mm -hmm. so what can you advise us, Lucy, in practice? What have you learned our, our mm -hmm. P95 masks? Or, and should we oh, just start them after this? <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. No, that's interesting. Usages or any practical? Yeah, yeah. So the poor, the poor size of these materials that you use, uh, no matter whether it's fabric or you know like a, a mask materials, um, typically uh, it re it really depends on the pore sizes and how the how the um, how the fibers are changing in size uh, due to temperature change. For example, if you use, uh, say, cotton-based materials and say one layer, for example, and there's, is, there's no torturous path for the particles to travel. It just goes straight in and straight out. And so those are obviously very um, not as effective as if you were to have, say, a three-layer mask, and that's pretty intuitive because you know three-layer fabric, it, you know, physically it creates those torturous paths for the part particles to travel. But not only that, the fibers that's uh, embedded in those mask material, like uh, say, you know, surgical mask, for example, um, they are much more immune to humidity change, so the fibers would not inflate. Uh, inside um, over time uh, as much. They do, uh, if you say uh, wear it for say 10 hours straight um, without much break, so you will see that the fibers would grow in size. There was you know, fiber growth, which would make the pores effectively much, much smaller. And so the effectiveness uh, of breathing, just simply the airflow is much more reduced. So you can see that those, you know, usually they don't recommend the, you know, for a surgeon to go into a, uh, into a, a surgery room, if they wear it for more than about 10 hours, it's a long surgery, um, they often feel headache because that's not necessarily just the particles, but it's also the fact that the, the air exchange, the effectiveness of, of um, air coming in and out um, had uh, sort of reduced in, uh, over time. So, so all of those um, goes into how well we can capture, um, which layer can capture effectively uh, the, the viral particle because they're, they're different in size comparing to a regular you know, talking droplets. So yeah, so so that's still, um, it's it's less of a, a you know, optimization uh, uh, study. It's more of a, you know, really looking at the changes over time, the mechanics mm -hmm. of it over time. Wow. I'm learning way more than what I want to in this talk. <laughs> okay. All right, thank, thank, thanks, thanks, thanks. Oh, Guo Wei, did you wanna, did you want to um, add, add anything or? Have yeah, my situation is very similar to Tomas. So before the pandemic, we already published in the different domain, mathematics, computer science, uh, biology, physics, chemistry. Uh, after the pandemic, so our work is somehow more focused on the, uh, on the correlating SARS-CoV-2, the mechanisms, things like that. So we tried to publish in the, the journals somehow access to People they are interested in the understanding of the mechanism of the of the pandemic, so uh, quite to evolution things like that. So this is a some a little bit of change over there, but generally it doesn't change much. So basically, we just tried to communicate our idea. For example, uh, like uh, in the February, early February, we predict uh, there's a new variant over there. Uh, it's a so-called mic micron. Uh, uh, <coughs> it's it's a it's a it's a uh, BA2, it's a new variant. We said that, that new variant is going to become a, like a dominating variant in the future. So that's something just like a 45 days ago. By, by today, it's already 90% circulating in the whole world. So this one already, so our prediction become true before our paper get published, sometimes like that, right? Uh -huh. Okay, great. Yeah, that's what I was saying, that the data are pouring in faster than you can analyze them, right? Yeah, wow. because we analyze the basic mechanism, the molecular mechanism of the of the protein uh, of the virus and the human cell interaction, and those molecular mechanism determine which virus uh, variant is going to go mm -hmm. to dominate. So it turns out to be just true. And basically, our predictions like uh, infectivity increase like one point five percent, 
and also the vaccine breakthrough capability increased 1.3%. And it turns out this seems exactly turn out to be found out in the experiment. There's a low difference at all. So, so that's actually very amazing to see such a prediction so accurate using deep learning, right? <laughs> and the mathematics for sure, yeah. Wow. Okay, thank you. Can you do anything okay. about future variants? Can you um, predict some future uh, mutations? That, that, that's the... a very good question. So our <laughs> prediction has turned out to be has such ability in the, actually in the early of the pandemic of 2020 in the summer, we predicted like a two, two mutation sites on the spike protein. One is uh, uh, 501, other one is, uh, is uh, uh, 542. Those two variants, we said, those two variants, two mutation side has a high ability to become a uh, where you creating new infective strains. And mm -hmm. it turns out all the current uh, more dominating uh, virus over there, like alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta, epsilon, uh, mu, and omicron, omicron B1, omicron B2, all of them include at least one of those were source size. Mm -hmm. Just remember, there's a uh, ten thousands of amino acid size over there. We pick up a two, two are uh, become so important. Wow! So that means right. we can predict mm -hmm. the future, right? That's true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Wow. All right. Well. Well. Okay. Wow. Uh, that brings up a whole bunch of questions that I have, but just really briefly. So, so what you're telling us, Guo Wei, is that despite what our well, whatever we're hearing from some of our colleagues in the US, um, the CDC and stuff, that the uh, variant um, is, is, is coming, that maybe the pandemic's coming to an end. I guess you, you're here to tell us that that's not gonna happen, I guess. <laughs> is that true? It's sort of because, uh, I mean, the, the damage is going to become smaller and smaller, just like any other variant. But okay. you say it's going to disappear tomorrow. That's not true. It's going. That's to not true. Going, okay. Yeah, it's still okay. going to probably wow. for a couple more years. But however, the damage, the peak of the deaths, the number of people deaths, is decreasing. That's true. Well, because that's we got we got a vaccine, we got a we got an antibody. That's the reason. Right? Wow. Yeah, we're okay. gaining well, immunity and resistance to. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that's it. Yeah. In the society. Yeah. Well, we heard it here, folks. Okay, so we, we have a part three, but I just, I'll just i just ask you each of you to touch on this for 30 seconds, like briefly, really briefly, because we have some great questions that came up, and now I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin in a second, but just really quickly, because we only have, gosh, I can't, we got like five minutes left, just really quickly, 30 seconds for each panelist. I feel like I'm on CNN where you don't, I'm going to have to cut you off, but anyway, um, any cross, any re, Thing that we haven't discussed about cross de departmental collaboration or collaboration as it relates to different institutions around the world or that, that you haven't collaborated previously and COVID 19's brought you together. Uh, Lucy, why don't we go to you first and we'll just quickly go around. Yeah, John's the research group is our collaborator. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I've known I've known his advisor for a long time, but we never really, um, you know, put a, an application at hand to be able to do this collaboration. And uh, um, many others, like I mentioned before, um, software um, software company um, who wanted to do this. And then, you know, we're working on some aspect of that in terms of the simulation development and methodology development. So yeah, a lot of uh, new and exciting collaborations that had came across over okay, the great. last two years. Okay, John, I'm probably gonna skip you because Lucy already mentioned you, unless there's something else you wanna mention really quick, but. No, yeah, I just want to add. I just oh, want to sure. add that uh, we work with RPI, but we also work with uh, other in institutions in China. Actually, oh, great. Uh, yes, or, or um, we develop a um, course, two courses uh, related with the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, so it was a very uh, integrated uh, project with other universities, not just uh, Purdue, it was China universities, but also University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. So oh. it was an interdisciplinary uh, work we did to develop all of these technologies to uh, okay. fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Great. Thanks. Tamar, anything to add there? 
I think mathematicians are infinitely adaptable. I mean, we're used to working um, on planes, on uh, you know, on a hiking trail, wherever we are. The the, the thoughts and the ideas flow, and and Zoom is just an, another way to communicate with people. I think that um, it's more an issue of a state of mind during the pandemic. I think Lucy touched upon it, but even if uh, you know, you don't have kids, it's still, we were all, at least in the early days, uh, early months of the pandemic, we were all worried where this is going, where, how is it going to end? Are we going to get sick? Are family members going to die? And I think that affects our productivity in some sense. So um, with the emergence of the vaccines, I think things were improving in that sense. And I think people were learn to adapt to the new, um, you know, half-life on Zoom and, and, and exploit it uh, to communicate with more colleagues, uh, to com communicate with colleagues overseas. I enjoyed going to many seminar series that I never would have had the opportunity before in Europe and other places. Uh -huh. Okay, Guo Wei, do you want to add anything there? Any interesting collaboration? Yeah, just briefly, uh, I basically extend the collaboration to something about eight people. A lot of them are experimentists during uh, about the correlating type of related research, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, Caitlin, do you want to get to those questions or do you want me to read them out? We got we have quite a few. Um, well, the um, second one um, relates kind of to this last question. Um, it talks about mathematical modeling towards public health problems is really an example of multidisciplinary collaboration between exact and life sciences. Um, so the question was, who are keener to leave their original Ivy Tower, applied mathematicians or life scientists? And how can this issue be overcome? Wow. Anybody? That's a pretty deep one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? So it was a lot of I mean, outreach, for yeah, sure. Go ahead, go ahead, Lucy, yeah. Go ahead, Lucy. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to take a lot of outreach to the general, um, you know, general public and, and other communities. So, yeah, so you do, it, so you, I'm sorry, so everybody agrees but, that this is an issue then, I guess. But I think during the pandemic, I mean, I think scientists have made a very good effort into communicating some of the key issues and I mean, with it came all the confusion that the data is evolving very quickly, um, but I still think that now the public knows what SARS-CoV-2, they know what an RNA virus, an mRNA, all these things that weren't in our vocabulary before, spike protein. Um, and, and I think that the pandemic has an effect on public science communication. Uh -huh. okay. Go away, did you uh -huh. wanna add something? Or yeah, maybe just quickly. So basically, sure. because of the pandemics, uh, I'm so lost half like uh, half a neuro, half a mathematician, half a neuro, whereas a neurologist, right? Something like that. So we learned a lot, we adapt a lot, and also somehow our position, a lot of our position become true. And I just wanted to emphasize those mathematical and AI based position, you cannot get it from a, from a, from, from, from experiments because of like uh, the mechanism of evolution, things like that. You have to discover it by integration of data, math, AI, things, everything together. Okay. Okay, and it is new, uh, 12 o'clock, but I'll ask quickly one more question. What kinds of models are available in order to model dynamics of COVID-19 and what strategies can be used to identify the parameters of such models? Lucy, would we go to you on this? Because it's about COVID, it's about dynamics and modeling. Oh, sure. I mean, a lot of, um, you know, methods or algorithm that we develop are all open source. So, um, so they're there. Um, the raw data really, the simulation data per se, um, are really 
depends on when we publish them, <laughs> but but uh, but but yeah, the algorithm themselves, um, boundary uh, conditions, and all that. Uh, much of what we do uh, are open source. So. so, so that being said, Lucy, in our, I'm just asking Kayla, maybe you can facilitate this. In our follow-up note, um, in our follow-up email, maybe we can. Um, if any any of the panelists, you want to have a link to your research. In our follow-up email, maybe we can make that available, Lucy, and people can get access to your, to your, to to these models. And Huawei and uh, Tamar, I'm sure that you have. I know you do Huawei. You have a bunch of simulations on your web page that people can look at. Tamar, I'm, do you do as well? Do you as well? Yeah, I wanted to mention in this connection that sure. I think the publication mode has changed a bit with SARS with the COVID nineteen because at least in the biophysics community, we made uh, much more of an effort to publish uh, work as soon as we had a paper done. So even before review, um, mm -hmm. whether BioArchive or Research Square from the Nature Journals, uh, preprints were made available and shared freely. And that was unprecedented. Um, this was not done before. And I think that has helped um, accelerate the science. Great. Great. Well, it looks like we covered all of our questions. Steve, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up today? Oh, there's always something I'd like to cover. You know me too well. But anyway, <laughs> but I'd like, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, participants were really from around the around the globe, North America, Europe, South America, might be a little bit too uh, late for our colleagues in overseas, but uh, we did the, 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 uh, the recording will be available so you can watch it again at your leisure. And last but not least, if you would like to author uh, any uh, new mathematics books or publish in De Gruyter journals, I would encourage you to contact to contact us and in our follow-up email, you'll have my contact information. I'd love to hear from you, love to hear what you're doing. And uh, we're certainly interested in, uh, in, publishing, in publishing your work. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Having... And stay tuned everyone. There's more, there's more webinars coming up. This is just our inaugural one. So you'll be hearing from us next quarter for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Thank you bye everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day.